Welcome to the mind of Lance Skurve, the most creatively profound man in cyberspace. Now, listen, before I jump into things, <laughs> welcome back to Lance Skurve. Always hit landscurve.com if you don't see me anywhere, because all the work will be there. A lot of scathing new writings will be there, old school style, where I do not hold back. You can't whip me in my own house. Anyway, welcome to another episode of Landscurve. Today may come off to a lot of people as though this is a doom and gloom type of negative show. Lance, don't talk about that. We should have everything positive and flowery and just so nice. Life is the balance of so many things. And the funny thing about it is with those who lean toward that all the time, go suck on the Prozac because life is balanced. Life is challenged. Life is not even staying in your comfort zone. You're going to have to feel something uncomfortable to grow. That's how life works. So I'm not trying to make you feel uncomfortable. I just want to, for some, they're going to take it as a clarification, a validation of how they've always felt or, and, or, I've been feeling this way for a long time and I just never said anything to anybody and it feels good that somebody talks about it. What am I talking about? The American dream. The American dream. <laughs> the American dream for who? The American dream never existed for certain people. Is certain a bad word? You know what certain means, right? The certain people helped to build the American dream for those who came over to that land and hijacked it to call themselves American. It's not for us. Now, in the media, yes, you'll see some of us who are so successful and they will tell you, yes, you have a shot of it because you see they made it. But it's almost like that pyramid scheme called J-O-B, job. Yes, a pyramid scheme. You get hired into a company and they tell you, well, you see this person here? They're a general manager. They're, they're this, they're that. They worked hard to get there. They take 16 years to get there, but it shows you, you can get there. Well, listen, the higher you go in any company, the less positions there are. Yes, those are powerful positions because you have to think and use the cerebral and use your brain, but the bottom line is, it's thin up there. The air is thin up there. So in the pyramid scheme, you know, in the pyramid, you have a really wide base, right? And you have one point at the top. The whole base is not going to go up where the point is. It's, it's impossible. So imagine all of those people on the bottom who just get hired or who've been there for a while and don't want to go push up to the top. They, they all try. It's like musical chairs, y'all. Come on, don't believe that. It's set up for you to fail. That's a fact. This is why you should do your own businesses and things to satisfy what is needed in your community. We'll, we'll talk about that later on. The American dream. Why are you still shackled to that empty promise? And of course, you see on the banner here, there's a couple staring at each other. They're not angry at each other, but they got little chains around their hand. An American, well, this the young lady has a, a, a chain around her a wrist and the American flag there. You can do it if you work hard enough. Your dreams can be realized. Look at the immigrants that come here. Oh, the outsiders that are uh, and Latin. And they, but even before that, you know, many people from other countries, granted, may not have uh, the privileges or, or I'm not going to say it that way, but where they came from was damn hard. So America seems easy. But we've always had stuff against us because it's like we're not allowed to hold these positions. Yes, they have some, but there's too many obstacles. And when they see you successful, it's almost like they're seeing the ghost. I want to just say this one example really early before I read these notes that I jotted down. But have you ever had a situation or known somebody this way who was really good at their job? I mean, really good. They were the go-to person, but they did things over and above their position, their title, and they had other people come into them and it helped them out. And you'd had a, a supervisor may come to them and say, hey, I need you to train this person. Sure. And you're being all nice, figuring that you're next in line for a promotion. And you train that person who doesn't look like you. And they end up being your superior on the job. But you taught them. 
and you've been there for a long time and you know they're not equipped because they have not absorbed the job so good like that. They may know things you told them and half of the stuff went and went in after the next. There's some things that you're going to have to get over time. And this is what happens. But that same person that you train, that's your direct supervisor now, has to keep coming back to you every single day to learn that job and to know that job. But they didn't pay you. They paid this person and put them over you. Isn't that something? And it's still stressing you to do most of the work that this person who you train d does. And they, they'll look past that because they can't have you go higher. Don't you see it? Right? So, you know, <laughs> I picked up on that a long time ago. The American dream. It's not for us. It didn't ex exist and it doesn't exist for most. You'll see people now. And it's not just America. It's Canada. It's all through the Caribbean. Just the West and the Western mentality, which also includes the UK and all these other, other countries that the people don't look like us, but they say the same thing. It's the same uh, script and the same play, but different actors, right? It's a hustle of us. It's a hustle of the masses to suck us down, to suck our life force and give us pieces of paper, which can just it could be monopoly money for all I care. You get the pieces of paper for your life force. And your life force is what you need to build your life. Brick by brick, stone by stone. Use their paper, but come out of it and, and, and do something for yourself. And you're going to have to be radical sometimes. Radical meaning sometimes you're going to have to leave the state, leave the country. The sun is the sun. Rain rains everywhere. Just figure out what type of system that you want to go under, which most of them are corrupt anyway. Greed is... Greed is, is a human trait that's all over the world. You're never going to escape it. But find some waters that you can navigate better than what's in the West. The people, they are so frustrated. Yes, they are. Let me, let me play a little clip and let you hear. Back. Why do you have to have permission to do anything at all anymore? Anything you want to do. I thought this was America. And I have to have permission. I have to get a permit to build a fence in my backyard. It's not even in the front yard by the road. My backyard, that fence right there. I was required to pull a permit just to build that fence. Now, did, did I do that? That's none of your business. But I was supposed to pull a permit to do that. You have to get permission to do anything. I have to pay the government like $30 a year just to go fishing at the lake with my son. I have to pay you. I have to get permission to go fish. Did you build the lake? No, God made the lake. Why am I paying to go fish there? It's unbelievable. I don't understand. I thought this was the land of the free and the home of the brave. Yet you can't even build something on your own property without getting permission from the government to do it. I just don't understand. I, I don't understand why we, people have to pay money to hunt, pay money to fish. What do you think I'm going and taking all the fish out of the lake? I'm catching and releasing, my guy. I don't why so why am I paying you just to just to show you my little card and say, see, I paid you money. Now I'm I'm able to be here at this lake that you don't even own. I, I don't get it. I, it makes no sense to me. I'll never understand it. I want my free country back. Makes no sense to me either. But this is what people are saying. This is how they're feeling. And that's something minor a fishing permit, right? But they'll fine you for that. But that's never been really my concern. My father used to take me fishing up to Lake Sebago in upstate New York. And it was a lake, but they had part of it like a beach. And it's a part that you can go fishing in. I used to love it. And there were little daily permits that you can get, I remember. You had to pay a little for a little license, a little permit, whatever. And of course, I understand they have to make their money to keep the beach and lake going on and whatnot. But it's really getting out of hand now. They're measuring fish. And I've heard guys years ago, especially when I was in corrections working in Orlando, Florida, how these guys who love to go fishing, they were just chastised by these people who, you know, work for the, for the state. And they were like sticklers for everything. Well, stretch the fish out. And, no, no, it's a quarter of an inch bigger. Uh, no, no, no. I'm giving you a fine. Well, you already paid for the license. Now you're going to get a fine just to fish. And, and really, too, who makes who makes the, the the borders of these countries? Who 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 breaks up the land and says you have to pay this person or pay that person? Like I never understood that. At what point was there no borders? At what point was there no um, property lines and stuff? At what point was it just nature? Because the animals don't acknowledge that. A dog will run across your property line and, and cramp in your yard and don't care because he doesn't see it. How are you going to convince a dog that? How are you going to convince a bird where not to fly? No, no, we can't fly here. We can only fly in this part. We only sip water on this side of the lake. Man, is <laughs> the system has, has, has messed up. It's not even just uh, 
America, like I said, is Canada, parts of the Caribbean, everywhere in the world. You turn your, no your news on, you see all types of distress and people stressed and they're not allowed to live. They're alive, but they're not allowed to live. Check this clip out, this chick from Canada. Hey everyone, I know who. I don't know a single person in Canada who's not struggling right now. Like my family, my husband's family, my friends, my coworkers, random people on this app or that you talk to on the street or in the grocery store. Like everyone is just on the brink of losing everything. Like we are literally just working to scrape by, to survive. It's like at this point, the only way to thrive and actually live is to leave. But it's almost impossible to leave because that's expensive and there's just so much criteria that you need to meet to get somewhere else. And then you have to leave everything behind. So it's just, there's this huge feeling of hopelessness all across Canada right now. Like I would love to be a mother and you know start the next phase of life but that would literally bankrupt us at this point we would have to sell our house and then what we wouldn't even be able to afford a new house so what move into their parents then i just literally can't afford to have kids we've been struggling all our life millionaire people under the system so you know it's bad when they start complaining <laughs> am i supposed to feel pity Am I? And there's so many other things we have to deal with, not just economic. Come on now. And again, this is not a doom and gloom thing. This is just about, this is just to ascertain that you're not losing your mind. That money is not stretching as it should. That the tensions and how we relate to each other and all the weird stuff that's coming to light. How do we make light of this? The simple life doesn't seem so bad now, does it? I love the simple life. I got out. I set up. I'm not a millionaire, but I love the simple life. I love the free life. You get up and be in nature. Get up when you want to. You don't have those worries. You're out of debt. All of those things. But the system pulls you in. Pulls you in deep. Now, I'm going to play one more. One more. One more. One more. Right? Here we go. This isn't where I don't want to pay my taxes anymore because I know where the money's going. I don't want to go to the grocery store, spend $400 on two bags of organic produce that's probably injected with it now and sprayed full of glyphosate still, even though it got the organic label on it. I'm tired of battling everything. I think about moving to another country, but you know, I know the government corruption is everywhere. I mean, it would be nice to live in a place where I could just eat food and know it's not being poisoned but it's just so exhausting it's so it's gotten to a point where i'm just mentally so tired and i talk to a lot of people at work and everybody says the exact same thing like we're on autopilot like everybody's just doing the minimum that we need to do and then just either going home and escaping or just numbing ourselves or just going to sleep or just whatever and it's so sad this isn't where i don't want to pay my tax mm. yep yep they are feeling it. Do I feel sorry? Hmm. I'm not really laughing because this situation is real. It's nothing to joke with. But see, all of a sudden that other people are feeling it more so and their sense of privilege is gone. It's like, ah, now you know what it's like. You know, <laughs> like rhythm and blues, they want our rhythm, but they don't want our blues. But I have another clip to play for you. It doesn't mean this, this one is not about complaining but it's how they're watching us through social media. Let me just drop it in so I can, when I start to flow, I can just really flow. Here we go. And the reason why I think you should do it is because it is going to shock the living hell out of you. I'm scared. You should be. Because when you download your information from Instagram, it'll give it to you within like 24, 48 hours to whatever email address your Instagram page is registered to. And it shows you every message you've ever sent to anyone, every comment you've ever made to anyone, every picture you've ever sent to anyone. It's all there in one folder. It was the most shocking thing. Now, I'm one of them squeaky clean people. I've never even said nothing silly or said nothing crazy, never made a crazy comment. But I bet you in this room, that's not the damn case. 
And I just want you to see it in black and white so that you understand how deep this thing called social media really goes. Think about that. So not only are we squeezed with our finances, working more, getting paid less, the crime, the drug addiction, the empty promises from politicians, the GMO food, the sickness that comes from not gaining any nutrition from fake food. All of these things are on our mind. We're being squeezed. Why can't we just live? Why can't we just live? I hope it doesn't sound like, why can't we all just get along? I'm not saying that. Why can't we just live? Isn't it all right when we're born into this world that we're here to live? Yes, we're here to be challenged. And there will be tragedies. I understand that. But that's the mystery of life. But <laughs> I want to share my jotted down words. In the annals of American history, the concept of the American dream has been woven into the fabric of society as a beacon of hope an opportunity. It's a promise that if you work hard and play by the rules, you can achieve success, prosperity, and happiness. However, for many Americans, this dream has morphed into a delusional reality, leaving them shackled to the remnants of a once vibrant hope. As they navigate through life, they find themselves grappling with disappointment setbacks and unfulfilled promises that chip away at the very foundation of their belief in the American dream. That's sad. The disillusionment with the American dream stems from a myriad of factors that have left countless individuals questioning the validity of the once cherished ideal. Here we delve into the various disappointments and struggles that have tarnished the allure of the American dream. And I say that again, the American dream really never existed for us. We were brought into something to create this American dream for somebody else. So I'm kind of being sarcastic every time I say the American dream because those who feel they were gonna get it, that didn't get it, that felt privileged, oh well, get to the back of the line. We've been here for a long time. Start our American dream. Make us believe in the American dream and deal with reparations. You're giving money to Japan. You're giving money to um, <laughs> is real. We can't even say that, right? You're, giving, you're having the migrants come into the country. You're giving them everything, but you can't give anything to people who built your country and put you in position to thrive for so many hundreds of years while we suffered. But number one, Got a couple things jotted down here. Number one is mounting debt. Despite working diligently and striving for financial stability, many Americans find themselves drowning in a sea of debt. From student loans to credit card debt, the burden of indebtedness weighs heavily on their shoulders, hindering their ability to achieve economic freedom and prosperity. It's a magic power, y'all. I'm not being funny. You get a check in the mail, let's just say you got a check in the mail for $2,500 out of nowhere. Now, you know it doesn't usually happen because when you're gonna get money, <laughs> you're expecting it. But you have somebody to transition to left you something, and it may be something substantial or something less, but whenever you seem to get that check in the mail or that money inside your account, guess what? You have a bit of joy for a couple of hours. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to pay this off and I'm going to go shopping and get the I always, I'm Listen, I'm going to splurge and I'm going to that restaurant later on. But, you know, you're having your moments of joy. You got that check for $2,500. You're getting another bill for $2,650. So now you're $150 in debt. And now you got a hundred dollars inside your bank account. So now you're $50 in debt. If you take that money out, you're scared you're going, going to go into overdraft because other things are going to come out and where you're going to get the $50 from. So you, in the morning, you get the check for 2,500. And by the time the evening comes, you didn't go shopping. You dressed up, you got, and you found out you had this thing. And now you're thinking, where am I going to get this $50 from? It knocked you back down lower than ever before. I don't want no part of it. It's just like in car wash when the old man was um, questioned in the jail. Not, not, not car wash. What's it called? Penitentiary. I'm sorry. Penitentiary. And he said, 
if I can't have all of it, I don't want any of it. <laughs> I'm not going to say what he was talking about, but somebody in the comment section or somebody listening to this knows, drop it in there. You can say it whichever way you want to say it, but explain what that old man meant by, if I can't have all of it, I don't want any of it. I need to find that sound bite so I can play it, right? I don't have it now, but I'll find it, right? Debts. It's always on us. We, oh, we have to turn into human calculators just to move about our day. Or I need to go buy some dog food. Or I need to go get a checkup. Or I need to renew this license that's going to expire in two weeks. Do, 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 do. How much money do I have now? How much money do I have next week? How much? It's too much. It's too much. I envy the animals, the birds that fly free, the animals that are out there. They're straight chilling. They don't know nothing about this. Why us? Why us? Number two, post-retirement work. The notion of retiring comfortably after years of hard work has become a distant fantasy for many Americans. Instead, they find themselves forced to continue working well into their golden years just to make ends meet, eroding the promise of a leisurely retirement. Young folks, take heed. For many and I'm not throwing off on young folks because they're younger, because I still have my young energy, even though I'm much older. The time moves fast. The system is now so twisted against having any hope from young. You need to carve out a plan now. You are your retirement. Don't depend on some 401k that depends on the market. And when the market crashes, you lose everything or working for some company where they can steal your retirement, or even getting a retirement that's not enough to sustain you. So how are you going to get this uh, sustainable retirement? I'm not a financial advisor, but it's, it's common sense. Pay off your debts from young. Don't worry about getting the luxury car several times over in your 20s and your 30s so you can ball around, because when you're in your 60s, that car that you had in your 30s is going to be 30 years old and probably you won't have it anymore. You might be on a bus stop waiting to go to a second job after you retire. Get your home, your house. Start going after your house. It doesn't have to be a mansion. It doesn't have to be a shack. You don't have to go move downtown where things are expensive. You can go out a little bit more where things are more affordable. That's what you really want. You can get a little yard space. And if the house is X amount of money, well, you lock that in and you say, well, I'll be paying for the next 20 years or the next 25 years. Don't do a 30. If you can do it in 15 years and it costs you, listen, just break it up into five separate segments. Five years here, five years there, and five years there. You'll pay less interest, meaning you'll pay less if you're 25, you need to be thinking about this. Even if you're 30, if you can be 30, if you're 25 now and you're goofing off and you work toward getting something good with some cash flow, you work, you get there 30, you get to 45, your house is paid for with a 15 year mortgage that will be a little higher, but you're paying into the principal more. I'm not a rocket scientist. I'm a little dumb in some things too, because everybody is a little stupid in something. Everybody doesn't know everything. You go to the hospital. And you talk to the heart specialist and you ask him some intricate, detailed question about the brain. He's not going to be able to tell you. He may know a little bit about it because he's a doctor and you have to know the other parts of the body. But he's not the go to person. He's not the specialist. But if old Lance Skurve can tell you something like this, Uncle Lance can tell you, trust me. It's got to be the truth because I done been around the world. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I learned my lessons. The place over your head. Nobody can evict you. Nobody can throw you out. And if you happen to be broke after you pay for this house, you're broke, but they're not going to throw you out. The worst thing to be is to be broke and on the curb. Do you really want that? Where is your life going? Where is your money going? The money is bad enough because it's already diminishing. Put yourself in a position. Don't get these debts. I would not touch a car. I would not, and just because you have money now, maybe you have money now, maybe you have a good paying job now, a good hustle now. Listen, ain't nothing like being in your own home that's paid for, your land's paid for, and nobody can throw you out. But you got to pay your taxes in America, too, and anywhere else. 
but try to get something you can afford that you know because it's bad. You get kicked out of your apartment. You say, I need to find me a hotel where I can, or I can crash in my friend's house. You don't feel good about that. And you start to think about all the money that you spent on frivolous foolishness. Number three, inadequate health care. Oh, that's something else, right? Not only you might be on the curb, broke, hungry, but you got to deal with inadequate health care. Access to affordable and comprehensive health care remains elusive for a significant portion of the population. Skyrocketing health care costs and insufficient coverage leave many Americans vulnerable to financial ruin in the event of a medical emergency, shattering the illusion of security and well-being. Isn't that sad? A friend of mine used to tell me that. Most of us are one major sickness away from being bankrupt. And I understood what he meant. I'm not dumb. But as you get older, you feel those words. You know, as much as they say you have this and Obamacare, these things don't cover everything. After a while, it's like, well, you're going to have to come up with this copay. You're going to have to come up with this. Do you have it? All I'm saying, we need to have more of a sense of urgency to the more important things in this life. Again, I've always been talking about cars and fancy cars. There's other things too. Spend it on jewelry. I remember back in 2008 when that great crash came and folks were selling off jewelry, cars, rims, fancy rims on cars, all these things they were selling off that they spent money for because they had it. Money was no issue in their mind. So, you know, the funny thing, money is like, and I don't want to say the word death, but I'm going to say it. Money is like death. When the time runs out before we transition, we don't really know. And when we have money, if you could know that, well, you're going to lose this job two months from now, but you're spending all this money that you can be living on for the next year until you find a job. We don't know. So move like you don't know. In life, cherish every single day. Make the most of it. With money, <laughs> yeah, be cheap. I'm not even going to say, oh, be frugal. No, I want to I, I say cheap. Be damn cheap. Because people are not going to come and bail you out. One in a million may. But most, they don't give a damn about you. They don't care about you at all. So your health care is very important. Look into that. And take care of your body. Why are you consuming all of this alcohol? Why are you, see, I'm not saying this to anybody in particular, so don't take it personal. Why are you eating all this bad food? Why do you keep all these bad hours? Why do you keep such a bad mind? The, the mind that we have lots of times, the envy, the jealousy, the competitiveness, wanting to keep up with the Joneses, that affects you. That's a sense of urgency that you don't need. I don't care what kind of car you drive. I don't care how many cars you drive. I don't care how big your house is. I don't care how many women you have laying up in your bed. Potential STDs, spiritually, spiritually transmitted demons, and sexually transmitted diseases. I don't care about that. To the point right now, I just want to have peace of mind. I don't even like leaving my house. I like to be home and I live an exciting life because I have it all between my ears. And I want to be prepared to even not have the internet. I want to be off the grid so much. I'm back to an old fashioned typewriter, pen, pencil, and paper drawing and having face to face conversations. The ultimate in entertainment, the ultimate in engagement because you're dealing not with LOLs, but you're dealing with real laughs. You're dealing with real hugs. You won't be touch starved. When you deal face to face. Number four, housing affordability crisis. The dream of home ownership has soured for many as soaring property prices and exorbitant rents render housing unattainable for a growing number of Americans. Yeah, not just the growing up, the majority forced to settle for subpar living conditions or burdened with astronomical mortgage payments. They find themselves trapped in a cycle of housing insecurity. 
Well, that's the main thing when they used to talk about with the American dream. You can have a home and you 2.5 vehicles, uh, uh, a white picket fence, a nice home. The wife stays home and deals with the kids and the husband goes out to work. What? I know households where the husband has to go out to work. The wife has to go out to work and she prostitutes on the side and they're still broke. <laughs> no, I'm dead serious. <laughs> And he knows it too. I just don't want to know. I'm turning my head. Oh, baby, we got to do something to pay you these bills and your money's not enough. I'm not telling you to go out there and do that. Well, I used to do it when you met me. That's how we met. Yeah, you're right about that. I fell in love with a hooker. Well, hooker, hooker is what hooker does. If she makes money, I'm not condoning them. I'm not going to get hooked up with no hooker anyway. You'll be getting them and you're laying up in the bed. How many men they've been with? Am I really making them feel good or they just numb? Well, that's a whole other different subject, y'all. You know, I'm stupid like that. Yeesh. Number five, crime and safety concerns. Escalating crime rates in many urban areas have made a safe, what, what, is, what did I write? A safety to luxury that few can afford. Excuse me, I was up all night. <laughs> Limited financial resources often confine individuals and families to high crime neighborhoods. You got that right. Exposing them to violence and insecurity, eroding the promise of a secure and tranquil existence. Money talks. Your money dictates where you live. And if you don't make much money, you're not going to be able to pay that huge rent to live in an affluent neighborhood or a better neighborhood. Money dictates this stuff. You see what I mean? The so-called hoods, which is not relegated to any race because people think, oh, you live in the hood, that's where the black people live. Listen, you got just as much white people in the white hoods and a mixture in all hoods as anything else, Latino, everything else. But there's always a Chinese restaurant there. They know you don't want to cook. <laughs> we make money off poor people. They get checked. They're hungry. They don't want to cook. We got them, but they better not come in our neighborhood. <laughs> but crime, all this stress of money, the health care, um, the housing, and then you're going to deal with crime. America is a very stressful place. And again, some have made it, most have not. And I'm over here now in West Africa, and there are so many people, I want to go to America. I want to make money. I want to drive cars like it. Yeah, but you're getting stuff on credit. How's your credit? And if you don't pay it, even if you're at your job, they will come and repossess your car, and everybody will be peeking out their window. How are you getting home today? And you don't even know what they're talking about. What do you mean, how am I getting home? I'm going to go home and drive. <laughs> you better check that parking lot. I've seen it. And in jobs like corrections where you can do a lot of overtime and you get used to living on that overtime and the overtime is not available, well, guess what? The repo man just has to go straight there without even knowing what he's going to repossess because he's going to get the call on what to take. I saw five vehicles in one day taken from a corrections parking lot. I'm not going to say where because they'll know I'm talking about them, but they know. Don't live above your means, right? Don't live above your means. Be smart. Crime is everywhere. That dictates where you live. You get a nice car in a bad neighborhood, they'll steal it. It's just it's always something. Make sure it be like a bird or, a, or, or, or an alligator or a deer and just go out in the woods. I can see people. I can understand why they want to go off the grid, the grid and live in a tent, not in the city. I wouldn't want to do it like that. But while you have a little bit of time to put yourself in position, try to do so because the handwriting is definitely on the wall. And for many, I'm just going to say it this way. For many, it's too late. It's too late because they're not going to change their thinking. They're not. Number six, burdensome taxes. The weight of taxes bears down heavily on the shoulders of hardworking Americans, diminishing their ability to achieve financial stability and prosperity. High tax rates coupled with complex tax codes create a sense of frustration and disillusionment, undermining the promise of upward mobility and success. We don't think about those taxes. You go live in a better neighborhood, you get a better house, you're successful that way. Now you got more taxes to pay. Well, you know, they have the schools around, the garbage pickup, all this other stuff. 
And lots of times people have told me, you know, what they pay for taxes. I never asked them. I pay X amount for what you pay that. That's a daggone mortgage in itself. Imagine that. And if you don't pay that, you out. So even when your house is paid for, you still got to pay the taxes. But try to get in the area where you're not paying big taxes. But too many of us, you know, there's stigmas on different neighborhoods and say, oh, that's, that's, that's not a great neighborhood. Or they don't have this and they don't have that. If you have a small vehicle to get around, you don't need that. You drive to it and you get back. I guess I'm a trailblazer. I don't know. I, I think different. But I like the way I think and I like the places that it has landed me. Number seven, double taxation. Not only do we get away from burdensome taxes, we got double taxation. The double taxation of income and purchases serves as a harsh reminder of the relentless drain on financial resources. With each paycheck and every purchase, Americans are reminded of the seemingly insurmountable obstacles standing in the way of their pursuit of the American dream. You get taxed out of your check. Well, guess what? You take that check that has been taxed. Well, guess what? When you go to the store to buy something, you're going to have to pay taxes again. How does that work? Why does everybody ha have to double dip in our money and we pay out all of this stuff at the end of the week or the end of whatever because our work schedules are different? We have very little. And that's usually to survive on. So some people say, I just can't leave the country. I just can't. I understand that. And it will close, on, close down on many people. Well, you can stay where you are. And for many, you're going to have to make ends meet and do better. But, but, but try to downsize. It used to be where folks were older, they would downsize. Well, you know, we're in our 60s and, you know, the, the kids are off to college and some have finished college and, you know, we raised our family successfully, have this big house and ah, it'd be easier just to have something smaller. It's easier to clean. In our golden years, we don't have to worry about so much. We'll go somewhere and get something smaller and not have to pay as much taxes and with a few amenities that we use now and the kids can always come and visit us. So we can always go and visit them and the grandkids. You don't, you, it's not like that anymore where you got to wait till you're retired. A lot of folks are downsizing at 35, not because of choice, because they have to. Oh, I can't afford that car no more, the maintenance on that car. So you're taking public transportation, which is nothing wrong. I've known people to do great things with public transportation. Listen, there was a gentleman, I forgot his name. I could see his face. And this is when I used to drive the bus. <laughs> I don't, I'm not calling him a joker like, like he's a clown or something's funny with him. I'm saying it in a sense of admiration. This joker, meaning like he, he said, to hell with the system. I'm going to break the rules and go against the rules. You know what this guy did? I call him a joker. I'm not putting him down. I, I have the biggest praise for him. He came out of the service. He had some type of military benefits i don't know if it was big i don't know if it's small but he lived in kansas city well didn't you say you're in orlando lands what about how, how do you know about kansas city he left kansas city his mother was getting older the father died he wasn't in his 20s at that point but he was like early 30s but he mapped out a plan for some reason, he favored Orlando. He loved the climate. And at the time, there was lots of construction jobs. This guy left Kansas City. He let his mother get the military benefits. I mean, he had the cash and send a, 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 a dual bank account, you know, a joint bank account. And she would get the money. And he wanted to fix up the house. And it was a couple more years to pay off the house. So you know what this joker did? And I say that in a good sense. This guy left Kansas City, came to Orlando. And then you would say, well, he has got to get an apartment. So that's going to negate the money. No. Homeboy went to the homeless shelter. To the homeless shelter. To the homeless shelter. And I think you had to pay X amount a day, like, I don't know, a couple dollars, like $5. I'm not sure what it was, but it was nothing. And when you work off hours you have to give them a reason because they don't let you come in any time of day or night right so he worked construction he had two pairs of outfits i think three 
to the working, heavy jeans, work boots, the shirts, and one where he would dress and go to a house of worship. Same outfit. And he did this for three years, I believe. After the second year, the house was paid for, right? Because he worked, he worked, he worked, and he saved. He gave back the military benefits to the mother to survive, and he sent money so that the place could be fixed up and paid for with other amenities. And he did this for three years. I want to ask you, how many of us would make this sacrifice? How many of us? He even met a young lady who said, listen, I would love for you to come live with me. You won't have to pay me anything. And you know what? He had the resolve to not do it. He said, that would be nice, but I would lose my edge. Right now, it's about my mother. And he showed me a picture of the young lady, and most men would go crazy if you saw that shape. Nice woman. But he did that for the time because that was his mission. And I found out later on because I, we weren't friends like that. He would just always ride the bus at different times. But he went back to Kansas City, and he came back with his mother for a visit to Disney. She always wanted to go. And then I found out that that young lady, he married her and they moved to Kansas City and they were doing very well with other things. It made you want to cry because that woman that told him, like, listen, it wasn't a sex thing. And I know they were having sex, but it wasn't just based on sex. Listen, you can come and be with me. And he said, no. She said, when he said that, she knew the integrity that this man possessed. And they were one big happy family. It was a beautiful thing. Wow. Number eight, the rising cost of transportation, the soaring cost of automobile insurance, and the ever-increasing prices of vehicles have transformed car ownership into a luxury that many Americans can ill afford. Limiting access to reliable or limited access to reliable transportation further exacerbates the challenges of daily life, hindering mobility and opportunity. Yeah, because if you can't get around, and especially what city you're in, and this is the way most big cities grow. They grow from the middle, the core, and they grow out. So the core, let's say, is you know, all the jobs, a lot of jobs, dense. If you live amongst that, you're good. A Uber ride, a bus ride that's short, even a bike ride, depending on the climate. No problem. But if you can't afford to live in those areas and you have to go further out, you're screwed because you got to pay more for transportation, time you lose. Because see, back in the day, especially like in New York City, right? You had Harlem before it was gentrified. And folks did not want to like live in Harlem. 110th Street was a cutoff point, like the movie Across 110th Street, because once you cross 110th Street, it was black folks, and taxi cabs didn't even want to go across 110th Street. If you said 110th Street, they're like, listen, I'll drop you halfway between 109 and 110. And, and I'm not going over there, and I'm damn sure not picking anything up. But after a while, things got so tough that Harlem was perfect to drop down into Midtown. So it began to get gentrified. People were buying up the properties that nobody wanted because it was the hood and, and drug infested. And no, they changed it around. But most cities grow at the core and it emanates out. And the further out you go, the cheaper it is. But way back in the day, it used to be where everybody wanted to be in the suburbs. Everybody wanted to be far away. But now people want to be closer to where they work. And it's not always at the core of the city. But you'll find the rents, whether it's Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, Miami, Dallas, Houston, Austin, Tech, whatever, Los Angeles, where everything is, not just job-wise, but the entertainment hub, everything. If you're there, you're close to the work. But can the work that you get and the pay that you get pay for you to live there, to have the amenity of not having, having a long commute and being right there to even work more? And who wants to work more? <laughs> crazy. Stagnant wages, despite increases in productivity and economic growth, wages have remained stagnant for many Americans, undermining 
the promise of prosperity and upward mobility. The gap between the rich and the poor continues to widen, leaving countless individuals struggling to make ends meet in a world of dwindling opportunities. God, dog, oh, dwindling opportunities. That don't even sound right. Dwindling opportunities. But that's the reality. Things are changing. We have the automation going on. We have AI. I, we have computers. We have where we go to Walmarts and, 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 and Targets and supermarkets. And, you know, it's where you just bag your own stuff and you go to the bank and there are not many people there anymore. It, everything is automated. Those are jobs that are lost. And it's going to get worse. So if you don't have a unique skill or you're going to be a laborer or whatever, but who wants, who wants that? And that's what the migrants are coming in for, to do all those jobs that many of us don't want to do. So what you going to do? You have to change the way you think. Because even look at it now. How many of us who are ageable enough to remember when you look for a job, you get the Sunday paper. And you look at the job ads. And you take your pen and you check off the potential job ads of the jobs that you think you can do. And then... You call early Monday, I guess, whatever, and you set up an appointment to go in for an interview. Or you heard that the warehouse somewhere was hiring and you went to that particular warehouse and you got the job. And guess what? Back in those days, you can ride out on that job for 20 years and retire off of that job with a pension. It ain't like that no more. It's a different world. Everything is online. You fill out for jobs online. Hey, that's a convenience, but it's so impersonal. And then you still have to go in and show your face. You have to do a background check. And lots of times folks are disappointed because of the criminal activity in their past or the drug usage that shows up in the drug test. It's just, and it's dwindling opportunities. So why do certain things to yourself and put yourself in certain positions? I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense, right? Number 10, declining social mobility. The dream of moving up the socioeconomic ladder has become increasingly elusive for most Americans. Limited access to quality education, entrenched systemic inequalities, and a lack of economic opportunities conspire to perp perpetrate cycles of poverty and disadvantage, stifling the aspirations of countless individuals. Shh. <laughs> The education, systemic inequalities, systemic racism. Let's throw that in there. <laughs> I've had to deal with that all my life, and I'm quite sure many of you have had to deal with it all. So, oh, stop complaining. Slavery is all about now. Right? Shut up. That's why they feeling it. That's why they feeling it. Let me play that clip again. Wait a second. Just show you they're feeling it. Yeah, this isn't where I don't want to pay my taxes anymore because I know where the money's going. I don't want to go to the grocery store, spend $400 on two bags of organic produce that's probably injected with it now and sprayed full of glyphosate still, even though it got the organic label on it. I'm tired of battling everything. I did think about moving to another country, but, you know, I know the government corruption is everywhere. I mean, it would be nice to live in a place where I could just eat food and know it's not being poisoned, but it's just so exhausting. It's so, it's gotten to a point where I'm just mentally so tired. And I talk to a lot of people at work and everybody says the exact same thing. Like we're on autopilot. Like everybody's just doing the minimum that we need to do. And then just either going home and escaping or just numbing ourselves or just going to sleep or just whatever. And it's so sad. This isn't where I don't want to pay my taxes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Economic instability. The specter of economic instability looms large in the minds of many Americans, casting a shadow of uncertainty over their financial future. From recessions to job insecurity, the volatile nature of the economy undermines the promise of stability and security, leaving many individuals teetering on the brink of financial ruin. That's self-explanatory. That's looming over the heads of most people because things are changing so much. Number 12, student loan crisis. 
The burden of student loan debt has reached epidemic proportions, crippling the financial prospects of an entire generation. Saddled with astronomical debt burdens, young Americans find themselves shackled to a future of limited opportunities and diminished prospects, thwarting the promise of upward mobility and success. You're in debt before you can even make money. I know people like that. Master's degrees in the hundreds and thousands, I mean, six-figure debts, not all of them. And they get around and they can't find a job in their field. Best to get a trade. Really and truly get a trade and go into business for yourself. And maybe you can work under somebody for a while. Get that the certificates, plumbing, electric, or whatever it may be, building, construction, whatever. So not just lifting cinder blocks, right? But doing something maybe specific in that where you are needed, right? It's not, not some cookie cutter thing where anybody can do, but something very unique. Here we go. It's unbelievable. Number 13, lack of affordable child care. The exorbitant costs of child care present a formidable barrier to economic advancement for many Americans. With child care expenses consuming a significant portion of their income, parents are left with limited options and diminished prospects for career advancement, undermining the promise of a better future for their children because they got to take care of their children. And, and, and you see, it's true of these notes that I jotted down, but I will say this, partially, and this is not in every case now, not in every case because everybody's situation is different, but for those who are dysfunctional, like as in dysfunctional families, you did it to yourself. The breakdown of the family. The breakdown of the family. What happened to be, be able to take care, to take your kids over to the aunt's house who's there and retired? Slip for a few dollars. If you're a little late, you don't have to rush and pay all this extra money. Family takes care of a lot of these things, but we've been busted up. And all of the categories I've mentioned before, the family unit, looking out for each other, not children and parents i gotta get my own car i got mine you you, you got to get yours no we're gonna have to pull together more whether your family consists of two people 10 people or just you and your cats well they can't do much for you but you get what i'm saying even friends that are friends for a long time and you know each other's characters as you get older if you're not even married why don't you get together and purchase a place together that you can split or something, you got to be creative these days to make it. You're not just going to hold true to, I'm going to have my place, and you, you're going to have to break it down somehow or end up in the street. That's what's going to happen. You're going to have to end up in the street. Environmental degre de degradation. Man, I'm getting tongue twisted. Now I'm feeling the fact that I was up all night. Now, number 14, the ravages of environmental degradation threaten the very foundation of the American dream. From polluted air and water to extreme weather events, the effects of climate change disproportionately impact marginalized communities, exacerbating existing inequalities and thwarting the promise of a brighter future for all Americans. This recent Kennedy, I keep forgetting his name, Robert Kennedy's uh, son, is it Robert Kennedy Jr.? <laughs> it makes sense, right? Whatever, it, whatever his name is, he spoke on this many decades ago. I remember this, like 20 years ago he mentioned that, that especially with black communities in America, they're not all the way too far away from a toxic dump or some soil that the county or the state knows is contaminated, but they don't say anything. Then you get kids walking home from school, it rains, the puddles, it splashed around in the puddles and... You know, it, it, it's close to us that way. Does it affect our drinking water? I don't know. Does it affect the air we breathe? I'm quite sure it does. There are a lot of things going against us that are unique and some things some people have to worry about and other things, you know, the privilege does help. But as you can see from the clips that I've played, the privilege doesn't even matter anymore. It really doesn't. 
It's, it's, it, it's an illusion for most people. And they realize when they have to wake up, oh my God, I shouldn't have to be, well, why should some have to go through certain things and you, you not go through certain things? The privilege these days in 2024, 2025, 2020 and beyond is going to be wiped off of these people's face. Am I angry? No, but it's balance. Because some people just had it too easy, too long, while others struggle. And they say, oh, you just pull yourself up by the bootstraps. No, no, it doesn't work that way, right? Number 15, inadequate social, sec so social safety net. I was about to say social security. I'm getting so close to getting it. If I, if I say the word social, I'm thinking about like security. Will it be there in a year when I'm supposed to get it? I don't know. But that retirement check and that, I'm looking forward to that. Pay me. I had to suffer. That's my rep reparations, right? <laughs> but inadequate social safety net. The fraying social safety net fails to provide adequate support for those in need, leaving many Americans vulnerable to poverty, homelessness, and despair. As social programs are slashed and funding is diverted away from essential services, the promise of a compassionate and equitable society remains unfulfilled. These are things we pay into. These are things that, you know, we don't mind letting people have because they paid into the system. But those things are drying up. But I tell you one thing, Ukraine will get all the weaponry they need. Certain countries that the people in them with Kanye West had a problem with, they'll get their billions every year. For what? For what? But you can't take care of the homeless veterans here. You can't take care of the people here who built your country. You can't be there for all people when they have medical issues where they used to be where, oh, you go to the hospital, you had your doctor's or creed or whatever it called, and you have to take care of these people regardless of their financial situation. First thing, you're in an emergency room. They don't say they can't treat you, but you're sitting there for hours because you told them when you went up to the window, you don't have health care. So you're going to sit there. You have health care or some type of program, you know, or coverage. I say, like, you get right in. Wait a second. I've been here for five hours and they just came in there and they got whisked away and taken care of. Well, that's the whole reality of how it is now. Don't get sick. It's going to cost you money. Big time. Number 16, racial injustice. The persistent scourge of race, racial injustice, injustice, I'm getting tired, y'all. I'm going to keep stuttering. <laughs> injustice casts a long shadow over the American dream, undermining the promise of equality and opportunity for all. From sin, sin, systemic racism to police brutality, the legacy of inequality continues to thwart the aspirations of countless individuals perpetrating cycles of poverty and disenfranchisement is still there. And they want, that's the elephant in the room. It's the elephant in the room after all these decades. And you got some of us who are spouting uh, uh, statistics that are wrong. Like who's paying you to say these things? There was a black man on Instagram saying, oh, yes, we're only 13 or 14 percent of the population, but we're committing 80, 80 percent of the crimes. Oh, are you serious? 80 percent of the crimes in America and we're only 14 percent or 13 percent. So that means most of us are oh, full time criminals. Full time criminals. Then. That's what you're saying. The media and social media sure paints us in a certain way. So when they put that nightstick up again against the side of our head in the middle of the night when they pull us over in their mind they're justified and they see us that way it doesn't make any sense right uh, now what I'm going to do I'm going to tell you to go to landscurve.com and read the rest not that I'm lazy but I like to give a good presentation and I'm falling out and it's a whole lot more and I'm going to read them off but I'm not going to do the explanations I just want you to understand that this thing called the American dream for most does not exist. And many will realize that it never existed. It's the ultimate pyramid uh, uh, scheme. You know, <laughs> you are your dream. You have the seeds of greatness inside of you and you have it all within. Don't look externally for some promise or something to be handed to you. Know that you have 
all that inside you and more. Start early, be consistent, focus, look to no one, and do the best that you can. So I'm going to read off a few more. And after it, racial injustice, it was gender inequality, health care disparities, mental health crisis, addiction epidemic, homelessness crisis, criminal justice system inequities, or in, yeah, inequities, immigration challenges, access to education, and technological displacement. Those are the ones I did not read off. So if you're interested, the link is in the chat. Look up top. You'll see it, and you can read everything off. And if you do go to the website, do leave your comments on the website because YouTube can sometimes remove your comments. Other platforms will do that because we're in the age of censorship right now. And when you talk about things that are very real to enlightened, not that I know everything, but I jotted a few points down and I'm falling out. I'm like, I'm stuttering and I'm like, so I'm going to grab a quick little nap, get up again and get back to work. We're going to do another show later on today. But I'm just so happy to be here, to be able to vibe with you. And um, it means a lot to me to do what I do. And it brings me great joy. And if it wasn't for the joy, you know, like I said, who knows what I'd be doing. But we all have to have something that we enjoy doing. And it's a beautiful thing. So until next time, which is a few more hours after I take this nap, read on the rest of them. Leave your comments on that particular blog, landscurve.com. That's where everything is. And um, we'll, we'll even have discussions here. If you leave a comment or you ask a question there, I'll answer it right on the blog. That, that's how you keep the blogs going. Because back in the day, 20 years ago, before Facebook and YouTube and all these different things, blogs were the thing. They were popping. But now we want to be entertained. We don't want to discuss, discuss things. It's a whole different generation right now. But back in the day, those days were so sweet online. Today, it's washed out and censored. Anyway, much love to you all. Take care. Thank you for your support. Like, share, and subscribe. Lance Curve. On to the next one. Peace.